Hello, good evening everyone. Welcome to the Royal Photographic Society. My name is Michael Pritchard and I'm the Royal Photographic Society's Director of Education and Public Affairs. The RPS has been running a number of strands of talks online from its award recipients through to young photographers and others working in photography such as curators and you can find details of forthcoming talks on the RPS website and there are recordings of some of the past ones also available to, to watch. So this evening, it's my pleasure to introduce Anne Strathy. Anne is a writer and historian, and her new book on Herbert Ponting is set to be the definitive biography, although I'm not sure she'd thank me for saying that. <laughs> Ponting was best known for his work with Scott in the Antarctic, but he was also a member of the RPS and was actively involved in its meetings and debates with other members. Anne will be talking and illustrating Ponting's life and activities. So we will start this evening with Anne's presentation and then open up to questions from the audience. Please use the Zoom chat at the bottom of your screen to ask questions and we will return to these at the end. So Anne, over to you. Thank you very much and thank you all for coming. Um, this is my third biography about people from Scott's um, Terra Nova expedition. So I came to Ponting through the Antarctic rather than photography. Um, the, the other biography of Ponting was written in 1969. And while that had the benefit of the author being able to meet people who knew Ponting, there's obviously a lot more information online, a lot of information, um, and Ponting's films have been re uh, mastered and everything. So there was a call for a new biography. Um, it was a challenge. Um, as the previous biographer found, Ponting had no diaries of the Antarctic or any of other of his travels that we can find. Some of his films are missing. His photographs are very scattered. His correspondence is very scattered. But I spent quite a few years going in Ponting's footsteps and gathering up artefacts and very much thank you to Ancestry and the British Newspaper Archive and other archives like them was able to find out a lot about a man who lived quite a lot of his life in the public gaze. Um, a brief explanation about the photos I'll be using tonight and that are in the book. They're not always the versions that you might be familiar with that you'd have seen at exhibitions of Ponting's work because I wanted to show his work in context. There are plenty of glossy exhibition catalogues with pictures and you can see them online. But I thought it was important to understand how he used them and what they meant to him. And we will only see a fraction of the pictures that are in the book. There are over 100. Um, and also, it will be a gallop through his life. Ponting had a much longer life than my previous subjects, one of whom died with Scott at the Pole, age 29. Um, the, he lived till he was 65, and he had many, many careers and lived in and visited many countries. So here we go. Um, Ponting, very typical of somebody who was born in mid-Victorian times, his family had gone from the soil. His father started off as a woodsman on the Savernac estate, but Ponting's father was a banker. And his father was already moving around the country. It was a boom time for banks. His father had started as a bank clerk in Wiltshire in um, age 16, but had already been to Worcestershire to get promotion, to get experience, came back to Salisbury as manager of a branch bank, but then went off again when Ponting was um, only seven. That picture on the top left is the uh, market square in Salisbury near where Ponting was born. There is a plaque up now. It was put up during lockdown, but it was immediately covered over with scaffolding, but hopefully will be soon emerging in all its glory. Um, Ponting's um, father on the right is, um, that's him in his prime when he was making his way up the banking ladder. He was a famous banker in his day. Um, and photography was very much the window on the world. Ponting's born 20 years after the Great Exhibition when Queen Victoria discovered stereo views. And it was very much stereo views that he loved from a very early age and they took him round the world. Um, 
the family moved from Wiltshire initially to Carlisle and um, to a bank that Ponting's father worked for. They then went um, to, they lived in Southport, but Ponting's father worked in Preston, Preston Bank, took it from near bankruptcy to huge success and being sold to what is now um, HSBC and made a fortune by those standards for middle class people in those days. And the assumption was that Ponting would become a banker. But Ponting um, didn't want to work in the Southport branch, which is down there of his father's bank. He wanted to work in the city. So he worked in Liverpool, um, very different from the other places he had lived and very much the gateway to the world with lines to America running ships running every day, increasingly with passengers as well as freight, um, and a lot of emigrants going there. Um, Ponting, but this time was a keen amateur photographer. He bought a Kodak camera and a fallow field detective camera, so-called, a box, special box camera. And um, he, I, I'm 99.99% .99 sure he was at the first International Photographic Exhibition in Liverpool, um, where a certain Alfred Stieglitz, who some of you may know his name, was an exhibitor while he was living in Germany. And Stieglitz comes into my book. They don't meet, I don't think, but he is, he could, takes a different trajectory from Ponting, but their paths do cross quite a lot photographically. Um, Ponting, after the first exhibition, international one, he joined the camera club, so by the second one he was entitled to go to the opening event. That was a huge exhibition with all, both of them were, with all the great names in photography, from the Annans to people like Stieglitz, who were very much up and coming, um, Peter Emerson. But Ponting enjoyed photography, and going to the Lake District and climbing a lot, lot more than he enjoyed banking. He didn't enjoy banking at all, to be honest. And he, um, I think possibly he did that technique that young people quite often do, which is if you don't enjoy something, you make yourself not very good at it. So while he had a head for figures, he um, engineered himself out of banking. He briefly worked in the Southport bank, but he persuaded his father to help him to get to America, which was the center of photography because Kodak was really coming to the fore then and very much go west young man. And there was a company that advertised fruit farms and fruit ranches for sale in California. And Father Ponting um, bought one of these um, for Ponting to manage. And that picture in the bottom right is Ponting's rather charming ranch in the foothills of the Sierra. I think that was probably another attraction because by this time he was climbing a lot in the Lake District and to have the Sierra Nevada on his doorstep. And um, you can probably just about see a little figure in a carriage, which is Ponting. This is from a, a um, bird's eye view map that was created of Auburn and we don't know whether that is the woman he eventually married but um, obviously the fruit farmer wanted a wife and the next stage of Ponting's life was oops sorry back one oh oh sorry I need to go back somehow yeah. keep on moving it forward no, sorry, I'll have to. You've got some arrows at the bottom of the screen and you should be able to. Oh, yes, oh, there we go. Thank you. Well spotted. They're very pale on this one. Sorry. Thank you. I jumped one. Here we are. Yeah, that's where we're. OK, so Ponting's in his ranch. Um, unfortunately, his arrival in America um, co coincided with a slump in 1893 and also with a glut in fruit. So his fruit farm didn't do very well. He moved into mining briefly, but by this time he was planning, oh, done it again. This time he was planning to get married. 
and he marries the woman you can see in the middle of those stereo views. Um, they had two children, one who was born in Auburn, and then they went to England, I think for a conference with Ponting's father about what Ponting's future would be. And while they were there, Ponting's son was born and at the son's christening, the register shows Ponting as being a banker again, um, not something he'd put on any of his shipping passenger records. So he, I think, must have worked temporarily in a bank in um, Yorkshire, where his father had moved to by then. And, but that obviously didn't last. His wife's mother died and they went back to America, I think much to Ponting's relief. The ranch was sold by this time um, and Ponting is looking around for gainful employment to support his wife and two children. Um, but what he really wants to do is take photographs. So he's wandering around on a sort of self-imposed furlough and he bumps into a photographer who is doing a photographic survey of the region of Sausalito, which has got these lovely views. And he asked Ponting for suggestions where he should set up his camera. And Ponting makes some suggestions and they get chatting and the guy asked to see Ponting's work. And he looks and said, this is really very good. You should be sending some of these stereo views off to stereo view companies. And you should send some of your more artistic photographs off to exhibitions or put them into competitions. This Ponting did, and you will see that the photograph of Ponting in a very similar view to his wife became an early stereo view. Um, he then starts going around and deliberately making sequences and what he calls writing up or writing round photographs. And he is sending his stereo views into stereo view companies. He sends this middle picture in with a whole lot of others of mules being tra uh, trained for to be used at the Boxer Re Rebellion um, into a magazine who publishes it. Um, the photograph in the bottom left is him near a mountain, but that also becomes a stereo. These ones I'm showing you now, are, unless they've got frames around, are actually Ponting's personal stereo views that I'll show you examples of later. Um, there's also the Strand magazine runs a thing called the Curiosities column. And Ponting sends in this top left photograph where if you see carefully where he's diving, He's got something between his hands, a little stick. And that is him doing what we would call now a selfie. He's got a string, he's got a camera on the boat or the jetty, and he pulls the string as he dives. Other people had used it to do portraits, but I don't think many of them were also divers. So he, that, he writes that up and sends it in, that gets published. His photographs of Chinatown, some of them get published, you can see in the top right. Um, when the picture of the mules, he uses very high quality equipment and that photo, which was in a magazine and probably a stereo view, but was actually blown up to exhibition size as well. And um, it gets accepted for the first San Francisco Salon. And he is, is remarked on by a man called Arnold Genta, photographer, who also who famously photographed San Francisco's Chinatown. But he said that Ponting had an eye for a photograph and also the knack of being there at the right time. Qualities that would serve him um, very well. So um, that is the beginning of Ponting's career. He then decides he's going to go up making it, but what he needs is a commission. And he gets hired by um, a stereo view company and a magazine to go to Asia. The purpose for the magazine is because the Philippine war is on that America's involved. So they're hiring as a sort of war correspondent. He catches the tail end of the Boxer Rebellion, but then 
The main reason for the Stereo View company is that they want stereo views of Asia, but principally of Japan, which is very popular. Everybody's interested in Japanism. Liberty is very popular. The Mikado is very popular. Ponting said in one of his books that he had been fascinated by Japan from an early age. And he absolutely, you can tell from everything he writes, he's completely in his element. He's a perfectionist, their craftsmen are perfectionists. He is slightly restrained. He finds the, the politeness and the cleanliness of the people very appealing. One of the craftsmen he is very interested in, the top right, um, is called Namikawa, who makes cloisonne, and the work and detail have got to be seen to be believed that he uses for that. That's one of his craftsmen making a vase for the emperor, um, layers and layers of metal and, and so on. Um, the other picture, the two pictures I wanted to show you were, um, that is a print by um, Hiroshige. Important for Ponting going forward is the composition um, and the large object in the foreground, it's very much the technique that you use for stereo views, as are the diagonals and the multiple planes in the photograph, because that's what you want in a stereo view. It's like a stage set that you get the layers looking back. Um, the other one is of interest, that is from Ponting's personal Japanese album, which sadly I couldn't afford to buy at auction a while ago. But you can see Ponting and a European companion um, out for the day in the countryside with some geisha girls. A lot of Westerners thought that geishas were prostitutes. Ponting in his book on Japan made it very clear that they're not. They're talented people who are trained in storytelling, music, tea ceremonies. Um, and you'll see later some of the photographs he took with them that were very different from the ones that other photographers were taking of Japan. Um, Ponting goes back and forward between Japan. I won't go into the details of the number of trips, but he's in and out of Japan about four times for prolonged periods. Um, but when he goes home, um, you might recognize the top view as being similar to the one of him and his wife, um, the stereo view. That's the view from his house in Sausalito. He put that into a competition by a lens maker, Bausch and Lom, and he got, got the um, prize for the section. And um, ships in San Francisco in, in the Bay of um, Sausalito, but taken very shortly. Those are the two ships in the background. Um, so he won a prize and a Bausch and Lom lens of which he was very fond from there. The other, um, he got accepted for the American, the first American photographic salon. That picture is Kodak's um, pavilion at the 1904 St. Louis World Fair. And the photo he had up in it was a six foot by four foot version of the mules photograph. Um, but this time he's coming to people's attention and he manages to get another commission um, to go back to Japan for Underwood and Underwood, which is the biggest stereo view company in the world. Um, he has got the old photographer's trick of being able to take photographs from a slightly different angle or different enough so that Underwood get different photos than the previous stereo view maker. And he's also taking photos for his own account to use with magazines. Um, the first time he only managed to photograph Fuji from a distance, Fuji's got um, five lakes around it and he went round Fuji masses of times, stayed in different places, took it across the lake, took it with telephoto lens. But this is Ponting in action, um, more snow, like Hiroshige's picture. Um, and you'll see he has got four bearers. The first one is a guide come bearer, but he's got four bearers carrying all his camera equipment. Um, he also, as a good climber, he goes up to the mouth of volcanoes. Um, and that is um, one of them erupting. 
is quite, he writes quite excitingly about that, which I did in try to express in my book as well. And some of his ascents of Fuji become quite overexciting as well. Um, some of the ascents and descents. Um, he's, he's physically very brave, um, but takes quite a lot of risks with himself and others. Um, on this second trip, he just before he leaves, it's becoming pretty obvious that Russia and Japan are going to go to war with each other. And he very cleverly, um, which I think they still use a lot of when countries are dangerously at war, he rushes around the sites which are um, going to be um, used during the war, like the main... Um, Sorry, Michael, I've just noticed somebody in the waiting room. Can, that's it, thank you. Um, the, um, he rushes around the sites where the war is likely to take place. So the fortified port of, um, a port of Arthur that the Japanese use. Um, and then the war breaks out, but the Japanese are very hot in censorship. Um, there are people like Jack London, um, who you may have heard of, the American writer. He is a war correspondent and he spends his time, what he refers to as drumming his heels in Tokyo and getting put in prison because he tries to get through to the front line. Ponting decides to make the most of it and do another ascent of Fuji, but he also goes, he's the top right, he goes to a, um, a war hospital in um, Hiroshima where he's allowed into operating theatres and that gives him pictures he can use for stereo views. He also um, goes to, um, he buy, buys a ladder and stands above the crowd so when the generals come back to Tokyo he can photograph them being cheered after the victories. He also gets to meet them while they're in Tokyo, and he takes photos of them, very unusually, with their children or their families. And these are very popular, these photographs. Um, but it's only on his, after waiting for many, many months, that he finally gets his permit to the front. And he still doesn't get to see very much, but he gets to photograph the trenches. By this time, the Japanese have beaten um, the Russians at Mukden, a big trading port. And then he um, comes back to Tokyo and gets the news of a huge naval victory, which is the biggest victory, um, the biggest sea battle since Trafalgar. Um, and the Japanese win that as well. So basically they have won the Russia-Japanese war. And Ponting is back in Tokyo. He's now got so many photos, he goes into a collaboration with um, a man called Keogawa, who is one of Japan's leading photographers, along with T. Inami, who is this, the stereo view specialist. But Ogawa's speciality is um, color type printing and very beautifully printed books um, on very beautiful paper, all very Japanese with layers of tissue. And you can see on the right hand one, um, that it's got tied, um, tied binding and these books are really beautiful and these are my rather um, old copies of them I managed to get from a bookseller and auction. The very good copies go for much more than I could afford but I'm very pleased to have those. Um, the photograph um, there is one of Ponting's most treasured ones of Fuji because he visited the site 14 times and um, it was only on the 14th visit that there were no clouds on Fuji, the sky was clear, the lake was still, the wind was down and the kai grass in the foreground wasn't rustling and moving. So the lengths he would have gone for photograph are like the ones you read descriptions of in the Wildlife Photographer of the Year. Um, and I do like it. I mean, the definition is incredible in, in the large scale version of it. But those are his two books, very popular with tourists, distributed in the Far East and um, bought by people at home. 
Montaigne at this point is wondering what to do with the rest of his life. Um, his, he and his wife, it wasn't a great match. I think they both had different expectations. Montaigne's children didn't really know him by this point. One time his son doesn't recognize him. Um, he realizes that what he is now is a traveling photographer. And probably if he'd known that, he probably wouldn't have married. But he decides he's not going to go back to California and he is going to go to London. So what he does is he writes to the, he joins the Royal Geographical Society, courtesy of an Anglo-Japanese friend, and he writes to the British Journal of Photography, telling them about some of his work and telling them about a swivel lens he designed, which works very well for stereo views and the ladder he uses, something he's going to, he hopes to get published in the magazine before he gets back. But before he does that, he gets offered the chance of going to India. And when he's on his way there, he, on the ship from Yokohama, he bumps into a man called Cecil Mears, who has been involved in the boxer, in the, in the Russia-Japanese war, is very extensively traveled and is on his way to China to climb in the, the China-Tibet foothills. People are by this time interested in going to Everest and Himalayas, um, the area that Ponting saw when he took that photograph, the stereo view there. Um, but the good thing about Mears, apart from being an interesting guy and British and having traveled a lot, is that he speaks Hindu. So he decides that he will join Ponting as a photographic assistant and um, interpreter and he, they go to, I'm going to use the old names, Ceylon, Burma, and then on to India. They travel all over. Um, Ponting rides on an elephant. He, um, they, they go to Benares, which I can't remember the modern name, um, and watches people, or where the Mela was, where, where people were washing in the, the Ganges um, quite recently. Um, and he, was very keen to see alligators in when he was in Ceylon, but didn't but uh, um, one of the aristocrats in India has got a tank of them beside in his own lake, and that's Ponting photographing him, um, and that's Mears photographing Ponting photographing the alligators. Um, oops, next, sorry. Sorry, that's the wrong one. Oh. Um, okay, so Ponting is now back in London. The British Journal of Photography have got galleries in Wellington Street and they offer him a solo exhibition. His photographs are very popular with magazines. He exhibits in the, um, in the RPS annual show with a company called Rains and Co who have made enlargements of his photographs for the BJP. His photographs of geishas, you can see on the left, they're very popular. Um, most stereo view manufacturers, uh, photographers, their Japanese photos are more like the one you can see with the yellow surround, um, quite touristy if you like, but people were very impressed with Ponting's ones, like the ones on the left, that were sort of intimate yet respectful. Um, he also, because by this time he is photographed in Yosemite, he's got the Himalayas, he's got endless photographs of Mount Fuji and volcanoes, he puts forward to the Alpine Club exhibition and he um, is exhibited there, but somebody makes a slightly sarcastic comment that they aren't really Alps in although some of them are the Japanese Alps, they're not really Alps in the European sense. So he takes himself off to Europe and he starts photographing the Matterhorn with its five surrounding lakes. So it's become his new Fuji, if you like. And then um, Mears continues his travels, has, they've parted from the Indian trip, I should have said, they, they parted so that Mears would continue to the Tibet border. 
Mears comes back to London after his own quite exciting adventures in Tibet and they meet up again and before they had parted in India, Mears has suggested, who's very, who was very keen to go on a polar ex, um, expedition, suggested that Ponting read Captain Scott's Discovery um, exhibition book, partly because some of Pont of those photographs had appeared in the same magazine by complete coincidence as some of Ponting, Ponting's Russia-Japanese war photographs. Mears then introduced Ponting to Scott and Scott takes P Ponting on for his expedition. Ponting, never a man to be doing one job when he could be doing two, starts buying photographic kit for the expedition he is trained by Arthur Newman, who some of you may know if you're an historic, interested in historical photographer, as the developer of um, Newman and Guardia, Sinclair Newman photographs. And these are original, that's an original glass negative I, I managed to acquire of Newman teaching Ponting. There are two pictures of that in the book. Um, Mike Pritchard kindly found me a copy of that photograph of Ponting in the hold of the Terra Nova and it's one of what we call the advertising photographs because if you you had it larger you could see that it says Burroughs Welcome on it because they provided developing fluid and then as now um, sponsors wanted place product placement photographs. Ponting is also trying to complete his Japanese memoir, which consists of some of the articles he's written about Japan before, plus new material. And that is um, a photograph in the top right called In Lotus Land, Japan. Um, I always think my publisher should read the book so they can see the, the lengths that Ponting put his publisher to, to get the color of that photograph that you see beside it right. He insisted it was heliotrope, not purple, the wisteria in Japan. He's also preparing photographs from his book and other ones for the Japan British Exhibition, which is about to open up White City. So he's pretty busy between November and June when the Terra Nova leaves. And he's not actually ready for the ship leaving. So he Scott, the, the, the ship goes in June with most of the crew aboard. Mears is off in picking up dogs and ponies in Siberia. Scott and some of the others are getting steamers, but Ponting keeps on having things to do, leaving it late. And to cut a long story and quite exciting story short, he only catches up with the ship briefly in Melbourne, long enough to get the rest of his camera kit on board. And then he arrives in New Zealand about six hours before they sail into harbour. So just makes it. They have a month or so in New Zealand and then they go down to the ice. And Ponting is under a lot of pressure because on the way down, he has got to do photographs and films that will be sent back to the ship in about a month's time to go back in March because the there are newspapers and the expedition committee and, and magazines and government who are waiting for the films and the others are all waiting for the photographs and Scott has been signing contracts up to the last moment for the photographs and films. There are contracts being signed in London and Ponting actually isn't aware of all these contracts, which is something that causes problems later. Um, I mentioned a bit there about professional role. He's the first professional photographer to go to Antarctica. Many people have gone and used cameras, but he's the first paid, fully trained one who doesn't have any other job. The fact he's one of a kind does cause some difficulties with the other crew because when they land, Scott excuses Ponting from unloading duties because he wants him to film and photograph the unloading. Some resentment among the young scientists in particular um, who have got their own cameras because they use them for their science, but so they think Ponting 
is doing the same as them. But um, while on very early days, one of the photographs Ponting captures is the one on the right, which is the grotto in the iceberg, which David Hempel and Adams said at the exhibition he helped curate was one of the iconic photographs of Antarctica. Um, so Ponting has sent a whole lot of photos back. So by March, the hut has been built with his laboratory, which is in the bottom right. He's quite a handy man with a, a hammer from his ranching days, and he builds most of that himself and fits it out. He discovers, he hoped that other people might be able to help him with his equipment, like the bearers you saw on Mount Fuji, but that's not the case at all. Everybody's got their own job and more. So he is left lugging 200 pounds worth of equipment across the ice. Um, he's got his dark room. That's a photograph that was taken for Burroughs Welcome. And everybody's got to keep fit because people have got a lot of traveling to do and they need to get fit before the winter. Daylight is shrinking at the rate of about half an hour a day. So Ponting is a real race against time to get photos to, and films to send back to England. Um, next photograph. Um, he's also got um, a lot of different people to satisfy. I've called them as clients in this list. Scott obviously wants, has paid him to record the expedition. The scientists need him to take very expert photos of some of the things they're doing and of them at work. His companions just want to be in the photograph, a lot of them who are going, this is their best record. Some have cameras, some don't. Edward Wilson, who is the chief scientist, he's also an artist, and there are things that are better by camera, things that are better done with painting, we'll talk about later. There are going to be formal expedition reports, so there's lots of straight photography for that. Newspapers are waiting for exciting photographs. Magazines are waiting for beautiful photographs. Government are waiting for their films. Ponting hopes to sell photographs to stereo view companies. There will be exhibitions of both of the exhibition, the expedition and Ponting hopes of his own photographs, for example, at the Alpine Club, all the mountains, and, and one of which there, Mount Erebus. And you will see that Ponting learns as he goes along because to me, the composition of that photograph of Erebus is very like the one of Fuji with the waterfall in front. The other thing he had learned from stereo views is the importance of foreground, background and of scales. So he's forever recruiting companions to stand beside um, ice, huge icebergs. But you have to keep moving. Um, just examples of the kind of things he, he photographs. That's them departing from the, for the depot lane journey. Um, photograph of Mears and Captain Oates in the, in the hut, very Rembrandt-esque, I think. Um, Captain Scott being taught by Ponting to take photographs. Portraits of people as they come back over the barrier. On the right, bottom right, wildlife. And um, Ponting and others are asked to give lectures in the winter, so he uses his lantern slides he's brought with him. And working with Edward Wilson, the one thing the camera totally fails to do is to get either the, the aurora and any of Ponting and the meteorologist Simpson try everything, long exposure, short exposure, nothing works at all. Um, also, Ponting liked being called a camera artist, and I think you can see from here, um, he was fascinated by ice formations, but these could be semi-abstract photographs. Similarly, very effective, the ones by flashlight. He really learned a lot about fl using flashlights when he was there. The autochrome, it has to be said, weren't slides project weren't a great success. They had traveled through the topics twice and were probably a bit damaged and probably out of date by that time. Ponting wasn't very happy with them, but Edward Wilson was at hand to get delicate sunset covers. And then one of my favorite photographs 
um, the one of the very few times it was published in Ponting's lifetime, and it's a great favourite now, which is um, Ponting sledge tracks crossing with the tracks in the Delhi. Um, so a semi-abstract photograph. Um, Ponting, after the, after the winter, Scott and the others leave for the pole. Ponting films them leaving. His job is now to come back and publicise the expedition because they still need to raise money. His films have already been shown in England. They're then shown again in um, the second series of films are shown at the London Coliseum in a bill topped by, like a part of a variety show, topped by Sarah ben Bernhardt, the great actress. In the programme is a slip that says, um, and I've got one of the originals, we know that Scott was seen on his way to the pole on the 4th of January, 1912. This is being written in October, 1912. Um, we expect to have news with him of him in early 1913 with when he got to the pole. The one thing they know, however, that Ponting knew when he got back to New Zealand in April, 1912, is that Amundsen had already got to the pole. But it still have been a great British achievement. Ponting had taught Birdie Bowers and Scott how to take, quote, selfies with the strings so that they could record themselves at the pole. But I think you know the story. Um, it was not to be, and Ponting was in Switzerland having a well-earned break when he learned that Scott had died. He came rushing back, memorial service in St Paul, the day after the news broke, really, and then there were a series of medal ceremonies and presentations. The ship came back. But the big difference all this made for Ponting is that his photographs were effectively public property and a memorial to the five men who had died. It changed the whole atmosphere of the exhibition expedition. Sorry, I keep on swapping them. Ponting did as well in letters. Um, the photo on the right is for one of the original photographs as it was shown at the Fine Art Society exhibition of the expedition, which came out just after the formal um, reports were published with lots of Ponting's photographs in that as well. But Ponting's photos weren't really his own to do with what he wanted for the whole of that year. But by early 1914, um, he was allowed to give cinema lectures and this was an innovative structure that he would talk, he would show still photos, he would show film clips as if you were in a lecture hall, um, but you were seeing moving pictures on screen as well, which had not been done before. His first lecture was introduced by Shackleton. Um, in a, that's him in a photo by Walter Bennington, which I was very pleased to publish in the book. Um, Ponting, having lived in America, didn't need to be taught about marketing, and he produced these um, postcards to advertise um, his shows. He also produced these miniature penguins and also ones with the adverts in French language because he had... Cecil Mears, he was in London at the Philharmonic Hall. Cecil Mears was going around the country. Actors were going around America, giving it with Gaumont's films, giving lectures to Ponting script, and a French speaker was in France, giving them as well. But it was all going very well, and the royal family came to Ponting's lectures and the Fine Arts Society exhibition. That's a letter from T Teddy Roosevelt, um, who came as well, and um, but and that was a great fo favourite photograph of Scott in his study, surrounded by his family photographs and his gear. But then World War One broke out. Um, Ponting, by that time, was in his mid forties. He was too old to volunteer. The War Office said and the Foreign Office declined his service as a war correspondent and said could he continue his, um, because by this time they were 
regarding Scots and the others' deaths as it became sort of subsumed into the sacrifice young men were making in the war, particularly Captain Oates. And Ponting was asked to send his films to the front and it was always Oates that rang a bell. Um, Ponting was sort of marking time during the war, but in 1918 and 19, he got the chance to go on expedition to Spitsbergen. But just before that, he met Frank Hurley, who had been on Shackleton's endurance expedition during the war. And the two of them got together a lot. They complained that neither Scott nor Shackleton or other expedition members understood how difficult it was for photographers to make a living. And they didn't understand about copyright. And he then, say, went to Spitsbergen but unfortunately for Ponting, during the post-war conference that was given over to Norway. Ponting's next endeavour um, was to write up a long-delayed memoir, which he called The Great White South. And that's him in 1921, as seen in the book. Um, Ponko the Penguin, mascot, comes to the fore again. An introduction by um, Kathleen Scott, he was allowed to quote the words of praise that the king had given for his photographs when he had shown them at Buckingham Palace in 1914. Um, and the book was an immediate bestseller with lots of reprints, um, very popular in schools. Um, he writes in slightly boy's own paper style. Oh, gone that wrong, overshot again. Um, his next thing, in next endeavor, are inventions. While he's doing his book, he's beginning to work on inventions, one which is a small um, movie camera, um, and he is trying to interest various people in it, including George Eastman. Part of the thing that people I hope find interesting is a very long correspondence with George Eastman, which the Eastman archives very kindly sent me copies of all the letters, and they've not been replicated before. Um, the correspondence. So they, because it's a businessman, very unusually, they've got both sides of the correspondence. So you can see Ponting's letters and um, Eastman's reply. And I'm very pleased to be able to do that. Um, Ponting is also trying to develop a thing called a distortograph that he's trying to get Eastman and other people interested in. But in the meantime, he is making a film from his, is effectively a film of his cinema lecture. So there's a live introduction by him and Teddy Evans, who was Scott's number two um, on the naval side of the expedition. And it then has got intertitles and it gets played at cinemas with music. And the picture you see there is at the Marble Arch Pavilion. And it's one of the very early sort of special premieres um, and the person who developed who um, promoted Ponting's films got um, naval rankings from one of the battleships to come and greet people as they arrived. Once the film the film is out people start writing to the newspapers and suggesting that Ponting's films should be bought for the nation Ponting's not making a huge amount for his films because just before the war, he paid Gomont a lot of money for the rights to them, but he didn't get that money back. So he's in debt from that. So it would be nice for him if they were bought for the nation rather than him just donating them. Then he has got, he has a good year in 1925. He gets the M Peter Emerson Medal for his stereo views. And he also meets a young opera singer. And um, Ponting's quite a man about town. You can see him there in his Buick. And on the right, you can see his photograph of Gly Corrodus. He had met her through Arthur Newman because Newman knew her family. And Ponting had met her family, her uncle, so all very respectable, at Newman's gatherings. Um, Ponting's a great networker. The other person before he went to Natarta, whose gatherings he went to was E.O. Hoppy, who by this time is a very well-connected, um, sorry, um, portrait photographer. Um, but Newman, he sees a lot of, um, and 
Newman's very interested in his um, in his um, inventions, and in fact, Newman takes a proposal for Ponting about his invention and his films to um, Kodak in Rochester in George Eastman because Newman, oops, Newman is a uh, advisor to him. Okay, home straight. Um, so Ponting's got out his new films, hasn't managed to sell his inventions. He is, has stopped trying to sell information. He gets somebody called the British Empire Film Institute institution. And a friend of his is involved in it, um, as is Teddy Evans. And they do get the institution to buy Ponting's films, The Nation. And that's Ponting presenting them to the Duke of York. Um, and I'm very grateful to the grandson of Alfred Bossom, who's on the right, um, for letting me use that photograph. Um, and you can see the box. And we don't know how much of that actual film stock went to the BFI, um, but certainly some of that film stock was used for the remastering later. And Ponting's two um, inventions, the kinematome, the kinetome he tried to sell in America, but this time, unfortunately for him, um, again, the depression, but also the fact that Kodak brought out both a mini projector, which is what Ponting had, but also a mini cine camera that works with it. So he was outflanked by Eastman. The distortograph, um, you can see that's his photographs of his friend Malcolm Campbell, who he met through the RAC club, I suspect. And um, it twists faces around and so on. And Ponting while he was developing, it used to go and see a lot of German films because they had surreal sequences in them, of which more later. So the last film Ponting makes is called 90 Degrees South, and that's it's to do a talkie. Um, so he's got his live introduction that's filmed, and this time, instead of intertitles and an orchestra, He's got voiceover and recorded music. It all costs him too much work, a money. He works himself to frazzle on it because he discovers that film track goes through at different, sorry, soundtrack is at different frames per second than film track, and that causes huge amounts of problems. Um, so he's overworked and overspent in his films. He's lost money on his financial investments, which included in companies who had share, who had mines in Spitsbergen, and his inventions are unsold. He then becomes ill. He's had bronchitis most of his life, which I think is why he likes going to mountains for fresh air. He eventually dies of that and heart problems. But just before he dies, there is a huge Royal Society, Royal Photographic Society retrospective. He's only joined the society in about 1921 through Arthur Newman in the technical section. He preferred to keep out of these debates about photographies and art photography as a science. He, he spanned both recording and artistic endeavor. And um, a big travel ex, um, exhibition effectively becomes a Ponting retrospective. It covers his whole career and is different. Uh, he's the biggest single exhibitor in it. Um, his distortograph is also used in a film of Emile and the Detectives, the English language version, and that can, the trade show of that is just the week he dies. So he had, does have a success with that. And when he dies, there are a host of warm obituaries about him the usual sort of time is one, but the film industry really, people in the film industry do like him. Um, and he's written about with great affection, including by Newman in the Photographic Journal. If you can read that online, um, you can find it on the RPS website, Michael knows about that. Um, there's a very lovely obituary by Newman saying Ponting wasn't perfect, he was over perfectionist, drove himself too hard, but he was a great friend and he said a light had gone out. So um, 
what of Ponting's legacies? Firstly, um, there was an exhibition in his flat, um, of which that is the program. Um, and then he had masses of stuff in his flat. There are artifacts everywhere. And then that is his photograph of Newman that many years later when Newman died was used for Newman's biography. Um, there are other ones you'll be more familiar with. The Great White Sands has been remastered. Um, Ponting, self-admittedly by both these people, taught Hurley of Shackleton's expedition and John Knoll of the Everest expedition. John, John Knoll came to Ponting's lectures 16 times before he went to Everest. Um, so they are part of his legacy, also 90 degrees south. Emil and the Detectives also remastered with the BFI. The, Scot the 1948 film, Scott of the Antarctic, a lot of the set pieces are from Ponting's images. You can see them if you look at both. And I've put this documentary um, by Richard Dimbleby when he sets out to talk about Scott's last journey, but spends most of the film talking about Ponting and his photography. And my ambition is to get that re-shown on the BBC in 2022, but there's some work to be done on that. Ponting's book on Antarctica has been republished under that title. You can see many, many exhibitions um, of which one of the greatest and most appropriate was The Heart of the Great Alone in the Queen's Gallery from the Royal Collections of Ponting's and Hurley's work. And The Great Point um, the, in Lotus Land Japan was published in Japan in 2011 in Japanese and that's a tiny little book but it was very nice to find it there when I was there. So thank you, there is more to come about Ponting, the plaque, the plaque in Salisbury will eventually re-emerge. Um, he's also mentioned a lot of his photos in my other two books. Um, I hope those of you who have read the other books enjoy reading about Ponting and those of you who have never read any of my books, I hope you enjoy reading about Ponting. And I want to end with the photograph in the middle, which is Ponting's grandson, great grandson in America. And that's his grandson with um, his Ponca toy, which is a reproduction made by the Greenwich Museum. So we've got one of the original mascots. So that's Harvey with Ponco. So thank you very much. That's it. Thank you, Anne. That was absolutely wonderful. And um, I thought I knew a fair bit about Ponting, but I realised how little I do know. So um, if anyone has any questions, do